What time is it? It's nation time. What time is it? It's nation time. Two news begins right now with Neon Collins. which will not long permit men to endure injustice, nor to wear the shackles of bondage in the rage of the powerless when they struggle to be free. And in the violence and conflict, which even now threaten to level the hills and the mountains. I believe that Jesus, the Black Messiah, was a revolutionary leader sent by God to rebuild the Black nation Israel, to liberate African people from powerlessness and from the oppression, brutality, and exploitation of the white Gentile world. I believe, I believe, I believe that the revolutionary spirit of God embodied in the Black Messiah is born anew in each generation and that Black Christian nationalists constitute the living remnants of God's chosen people in this day and are charged by God with responsibility for the liberation of African people. I believe, I believe, I believe that both my survival and my salvation depend upon my willingness to reject individualism. And so I commit my life to the liberation struggle of African people and accept the values, ethics, morals, and program of the Black nation defined by that struggle and taught by the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. Get connected and stay connected online with the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Worship, join, learn, give, connect with us all in one place in just three easy steps. One. Go to our landing page via our Linktree URL or QR code. Two, browse our selections and decide what you want to do and where you want to go. Three, click on your choice and we'll take you right there. Yes, in just three easy steps, you can worship, join, learn, give, all in one place. So get connected and stay connected with us online at the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Greetings. I'm so glad that you have taken the time to join me today as we move through this Pentecost season, the 50-day period that follows Easter. Here in the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church, we observe Pentecost as one of our seven seasons of faith that make up our annual cycle of rebirth. Foundational to our belief is the understanding that we exist within continuous cycles. We acknowledge and celebrate the wisdom of our African ancestors who for countless generations observed various cycles, such as day turning into night, 
The seasonal changes from spring to summer to fall to winter, and even the awareness that in our full breaths, each of our inhalations will be followed by exhalations. We acknowledge these phenomena as we live, move, and have our total being in the midst of a divine energy source that is called by many names, revered and acknowledged in different ways. We believe that we exist within this greater source that we describe as cosmic energy and creative intelligence and are endowed with an aspect of inner divinity that designates us as co-creators. As co-creators, we have the power to be self-reliant and self-determined. And that's encouraging news today, especially when we find ourselves confronted daily by instances of chaos and challenges. I know I'm not the only one who realizes that challenges occur with or without warning. It can be as simple as following a recipe or riding a bike. Or it can be as complicated as assembling a structure such as a bookshelf with only pictures as a guide or learning a second language. Challenges can happen in an instant, like an abrupt road closure that requires a detour and change in direction. And challenges could also happen over extended periods of time, as in the case when the advancing of your age complicates tasks that were so much simpler in earlier points of your life. But history teaches us that we have seen challenges before. True history tells us that we have seen challenges since our forced arrival on this continent. Accurate history tells us that we have not only seen but have also confronted those challenges and we have faced them and the trouble that results. As a matter of fact, we have started trouble of our own. Good trouble. My scripture today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 49. I am going to send you what my father has promised but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Now this scripture follows a period after Jesus' crucifixion. Contrary to what you may have heard, Jesus' death was not celebrated, was not looked upon as a sign of victory for his followers. After his crucifixion, they were dismayed, downtrodden, dejected, depressed. They fled the scene and attempted to go back to their former lives. Many theologians have studied this period and attribute the many appearances of the risen Christ as being necessary to help the disciples to recover their faith, which had been lost. You heard the story. Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples who sold him out. After Jesus was arrested, his most trusted disciple, Peter, denied knowing him not once, but three times. And as he hung on the cross, only a few gathered near for fear of being arrested themselves. Among those that were present was his mother, Mary the Black Madonna, Mary Magdalene, and a beloved disciple. But Jesus had been crucified. His followers wondered, how could the Messiah be crucified? Had they forgotten that the year of Jesus' birth there had been crucifixions of 4,000 around the walls of Jerusalem because they dared to revolt against Roman domination. But why Jesus? What was his crime? According to scripture, he was considered a threat, a danger to the status quo. So we find in Luke 23, verses 2 through 5, it says, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, it is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. Jesus was making trouble. How dare you open the eyes of the blind, Jesus? How dare you give strength to the feeble, Jesus? How dare you give new life to those who have been confirmed dead on arrival? 
Just why was Jesus so bold? As we continue our reading, we find in Luke 4, 18 and 19, it says, he read, he got a scroll from Isaiah and read, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But wait a minute, reading that was not enough. He went on further as it shows in verses 20 to 21. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I'll call that a drop the mic moment. Sounds like he's the troublemaker to me. But what kind of trouble was he starting? I say it was good trouble. Good trouble stands in defiance of norms that are unjust and biased. We need good trouble even today. Trouble that disrupts and corrects the wrongs that are being inflicted upon people. Just ask somebody who has grown up in a society where you are judged by your looks and appearance. Just ask somebody who has been regarded as less than. Just ask somebody who has been denied, accused, and marginalized because of their zip code. Just ask somebody. You may recall hearing about a young student here in the state of Texas, in the town of Bellevue, Daryl George. He was deemed out of compliance and placed in in-school suspension indefinitely because he dared to wear his hair in locks. Even though legislation had been passed instituting what is called the Crown Act. The Crown Act, which was stand, the, the letters stand for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair, was a legislative solution that prohibited race-based hair discrimination. But the Crown Act, even though it's been enacted in several states, had a loophole in Texas. It stalled because they said you can't wear your hair longer than two inches. So what are they saying? They deemed him as being out of compliance. They deemed him as not upholding the, the rules of the school. They were targeting him because of his black hair. So here he was being defiant. Was he in trouble? That's what usually happens when somebody's in in-school suspension is because they're a troublemaker or they're causing trouble. But what kind of trouble was he causing? What kind of disruption was he creating? Because he failed to live up to their expectations. He was making good trouble. He is being labeled a troublemaker because of his belief that we each possess a beauty inside that speaks to us and is evidence in our daily lives, in spite of current trends of what others define as or accept as popular. You see, each of us has an inner spirit that seeks fulfillment even in the face of adversity. And that spirit compels us not only to confront trouble, but create certain moments that call for you to create good trouble. I, I know what you're asking. How often will we need good trouble, preacher? Since you asked, we need it whenever inequity and injustices occur. It was needed during the transatlantic slave trade and was manifested in the countless attempts to resist and overturn an unjust system. African captives who had been viciously taken from their homelands, brought against their will to another land, were denied their humanity. One such rebellion was that of Senke, the leader of the revolt on the ship called the Amistad. The story of their fight for freedom involved several trials through the U.S. court systems. They even were imprisoned while they awaited the judgment and had to go through several appeals processes before they eventually were deemed as being having the right to be free and return to their motherland Africa. One might ask, why was it so difficult for Senke and the others to obtain justice? What we learned is that being in the right is not always enough. You see, Jesus was committed to his mission and it cost him his life. But he understood the risk. 
Matthew 8, 18 through 20 says, when Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the sea. And one of the scribes came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. So when you ask me, how often will we need good trouble, preacher? I'm reminded of Rosa Parks. You see, she knew that she had to do something to help usher in the Montgomery bus boycott because of the injustices and the damage that was being done to people in Montgomery. She made good trouble. Now I know many tried to paint the picture of her as just being an average black woman who was just too tired to give up her seat on the bus. And so she happened to get arrested. But in describing what happened on that day in December of 1955 in the book called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, it gives her personal account. And in the book it says, when the driver ordered them to get up from their seats, no one moved. Getting agitated, the bus driver said, you all better make it light on yourselves and let me have those seats. Parks reflected to herself on how giving up her seat wasn't making it light on ourselves as a people. She thought about her grandfather keeping his gun to protect their family. She thought about Emmett Till and she decided to stand fast. People always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically or no more tired than I usually was at the end of a working day. No, the only tired I was was tired of giving in. You see, whites would accuse you of causing trouble when all you were doing was acting like a normal human being instead of cringing. That's the words of Rosa Parks. She explained, I wasn't tired, I was determined. She was making good trouble. What made her feel that she could do that? She looked to her faith. In her words, she said, God has always given me the strength to say what is right. She attributed her courage to the history of black freedom fighters who had come before her. She said, I had the strength of God and my ancestors with me. So even in the face of adversity, she still was able to make good trouble. This is a message that the scripture is trying to tell the disciples. Even though you are in despair, don't stop. They were despondent. Luke 24, 17 to 21 says, they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleophas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth? They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They couldn't stop. The scripture says, stay in the city, I will send you what, your father, what our father has promised you, but just stay in the city. You see, throughout our history, we've run into challenges, we've run into obstacles, but we still refuse to stop, we refuse to quit. We've had a stony road, that we have tried, but we kept marching on. The power and the lessons of Pentecost are revealed in the triumph of coming back together and recovering the faith that results when you come together as a group. So it was during that period of the 50 days where the disciples recovered their faith because they confronted their doubts, they admitted their mistakes, they understood that they had to come together and stay together. There was strength in their fellowship. So they did that for that 40, 50 day period. They would eventually rebuild their faith in themselves and build an even greater movement with thousands joining. You see, the disciples became troublemakers themselves, and they were making good trouble. So when you ask me, how often do we need good trouble? I can't help but think of our good brother, the late John Lewis, congressman from Georgia, who dedicated most of his life to the movement. He began to have a growing awareness as a teenager and later as a college student when he was, became a leader in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also called, called SNCC or SNCC. But most notably, 
was his constant reminder to us of how important voting is, how hard people fought to, and sacrificed so that we had the opportunity to exercise the right. He described the events that occurred on what was called Bloody Sunday. You may have seen the pictures where they were trying to cross the Edmunds Pettus Bridge. But what happened on that Sunday was not an isolated event. It was not an actual, just one single event of violence. There had been voter registration campaign launched prior to that event. They had a campaign in Selma and nearby Marion, Alabama. But violence occurred. What happened in February of 1965, police began to attack against nonviolent demonstrators. On the night of February the 18th, it stated that Alabama troopers joined the local police to break up an evening march in Marion. And in the ensuing events, a state trooper shot a brother, Jamie Lee Jackson, 26 year old church deacon from Marion, as he tried to protect his mother from the Billy Cubs. They were fighting for voting rights. They were standing up for the ability for us to voice our opinion, to take a stand. They were making good trouble. But in response to Jackson's death, activists came together in Selma and decided to march across this bridge to the state capital of Montgomery. Reverend Hosea Williams joined John Lewis, who was representing SNCC, and they began to march. But as they made their way through the crowds, well, as they made their way across, trying to cross Edmund Pettus Bridge, they were faced with a blockade of state troopers and local police who commanded them to stop, who ordered them to turn back, who told them that they had to disperse. And when they did not, the men were ordered to advance. And they weren't by themselves, they were cheered on by white mobs, onlookers, who incited them to continue to beat the, the marchers the crowds with the clubs and tear gas. Modern police chased them and retreated and they began to beat them. Now over the years, John Lewis didn't shy away from creating good trouble or speaking up for the disenfranchised or speaking up for the rights of the oppressed. In a speech that he delivered almost 10 years ago at Emory University, he began to urge students that they needed to make good trouble. And he gave them a little background. He told them, in 1957, I met Rosa Parks at the age of 17. In 1958, in the age of 18, I met Martin Luther King Jr. And these two individuals inspired me to get in the way, to get in trouble. So I come here to say to you this morning on this beautiful campus with your great education, you must find a way to get in the way. You must find a way to get in trouble, good trouble necessary trouble. As young people, you must understand that there are forces that want to take us back to another period. But you must say that we're not going back. We made too much progress and we are going forward. There may be some setbacks, some delays, some disappointment, but you must never ever give up or give in. You must keep the faith and keep your eyes on the prize that is calling you. That is your calling. That is your mission. That is your moral obligation. This is your mandate. Get out there and do it. Get in the way. John Lewis could be talking to us today. Here in the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church for 70 years, we have sought as a church to bring about the best in ourselves. That meant we had to create some good trouble. We sought to, in spite of what was said, recognize the beauty within ourselves. We told the truth about our history. We created good trouble and dared to tell the truth about the historic blackness of Israel, of Jesus and his mother, the Black Madonna. I say this because there's somebody out there today who needs to hear that even during these times of chaos, where we experience unsettling events, periods of distress, with threats of unrest, where trouble seems to be ever present and growing in different ways. All is not lost. I, I think that there's somebody who needs to know that just because there seems to be trouble in front of you, there is still hope. 
just because trouble is coming up in your rear, there's a solution that can be found. There may be trouble rising on the horizon, but all is not lost. We need good trouble. Why? Because our children's education is being derailed. Books are being banned. History is being denied. We need good trouble. Why? Because our ability to speak for ourselves through voting is being suppressed and gerrymandered. We need good trouble. Why? Because our ability to determine how we can use and take care of our body is being mandated and hijacked. I want somebody to know today that Pentecost was not just for the disciples. Pentecost is also for us. We can use the power to become greater. We can use the power to become more sufficient, more independent. We have the power to change ourselves, to change the trajectory of our destiny. Pentecost can happen for anyone, at any time, in any place. Just open yourself, just feel the power, and then use it to make good trouble. Good trouble. Good trouble. Amen. And I say. Family, if what you heard in the message moved or inspired you to do something, then don't hesitate to reach out to us and discover how you can become an agent for change and an instrument of social, political, economic, and environmental justice together with us as a follower or subscriber of our Best Self Movement. So don't delay. Just go to our web link, www.linktr.ee forward slash SOBM. That's Linktree forward slash SOBM. And get involved in our Pan-African global struggle for dignity, self-determination, power, and freedom today. And please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and comment to help us grow our virtual Pan-African village with our people everywhere. Ashe and Amen. Of course I'm going to the Sinai. All my friends and family going to be there. We grew up in the Keep Land. Of course we're going to the Sinai. We're the Maccabees. Of course we're going, going to the Sinai. We're the Women's Ministry. Of course we're going to the Sinai. Of course, I'm a magazine. Of course, I'm going to the Senate. I'm the regional coordinator. Of course, I'm going to the Senate. And I hope you all can join me.